We failed to qualify for the goddamn World Cup in Trinidad, and the president and the coach after the game are saying, well, there doesn't need to really be substantial change. This is a one-off. Welcome in to episode seven of the heart of the game, the show where we get to know the voices of football, the voices of the beautiful game. I'm your host, Nate Abarea, and in this edition of the heart of the game, we're joined by one of the most recognizable voices in the American soccer landscape, our friend Taylor Twellman. So without further ado, let's do this thing. So, Taylor, this show, as you know, has been dedicated to the craft of football commentary. And I want to open up by asking you a a rather open-ended question, but it's one that I think will really get things flowing in the right direction here. And that is, what do you love most about the craft of, as we call it in the States, color commentary, or as they call it overseas, co-commentary? What do you love most about calling matches? Oh, wow. Nate, that's a uh, good start to the uh, conversation. I I think for me, the most addicting part of commentating is every single game is different. And it seems so impossible to be true. And yet there is a moment or two in every single game. And listen, I've done some of the worst games ever. Uh, I particularly remember, I think, Northern Ireland-Wales Euro game in 2016. That was one of the worst games I've ever done. I've done a couple MLS games that are absolute drubs, and you just think about it, and you're like, wait a minute, but there's one or two instances in those games that's completely new to you, completely different, and how do you react? How do you respond? Um, It's eerily similar to being a player. You know what I mean, Nate, where you, every single game, every single circumstance, the different things happen, different situations pop up. You're judged so much on your reaction and, and what, how you handle that. So I, I would say that's the most addicting part to it for me is that aspect. Um, but I think for the listener to fully understand where I'm coming from, you have to remember my playing career ended in the prime of my career right when I was on the verge you know there was a three million dollar offer to go to England and I had so many opportunities to further my career and then in the blink of an eye my career is over it's done with and so I start commentating when I still feel like I've got a solid five six years under the belt and uh, that's kind of why I'm addicted to it. I think it kind of saved my mental health. It, it saved my life. And it also motivated me for uh, the second phase of my quote unquote football soccer career. Well, that transitions perfectly into what I wanted to talk about with you next. And going back to a time in the summer of 2010, and I actually got to share a very, very brief conversation with you, Taylor, at Buckshaw Stadium in Santa yes. Clara, California, yeah, after a after a San Jose Earthquakes Tottenham Hotspur friendly. And it's wild as we're talking in 2020 now and how much both of our lives have have changed and grown. And so going right back to you. 10 years after that uh, initial meeting uh, for for yours truly and and yourself. And here we are on the microphones uh, together 10 years later. What have you learned? What what, what have you have you really appreciated learning the most uh, as far as the craft of co-commentary in that whole decade, Taylor? That's amazing, Nate. Um, That was literally my first game ever. And the background for the listener, the listeners would appreciate this. So. Former teammate of mine, Doug Warren, was getting married that Saturday evening. And during the 2010 World Cup, I was approached by a local guy here in Boston by the name of Kevin Miller. He was running NBC Sports Boston. He said, hey, you know, I know your playing career is in limbo right now. I think you'd be good on TV. During the World Cup, why don't you come in, do a five to seven minute sit down for our news desk? 
Um, we'll do it every day. Uh, and you can kind of learn it. Well, three days later, he has me hosting their number one show at nighttime, 1030. I've never done TV before in my life, Nate. Um, and a real good friend of mine by the name of Tom McNeely uh, was the producer for the MLS games for ESPN. And he's, you know, we've had maybe a thousand to 1500 beers together. Nate, I had no idea what his job was. I just thought he worked for ESPN. I didn't know he was literally producing <laughs> my games playing until the 2010 World Cup. He calls me from South Africa and he says, hey, I'm in a little bit of a bind. I need someone to commentate this game. Do you have any interest? And I was like, no, nah, I'm not. And Tom stopped on the phone. For about three seconds, and he said, I'm going to ask one more time because I'm not sure I'm going to ever ask again. And I was like, Tom, you've had how many beers with me? I'm just not sure commentating's for me. And he was like, no, 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 no. I think you, you owe me this along with 24 other beers, but you just need to do this. So I was like, oh, man, what do I do? And he goes, it's Tottenham versus San Jose Earthquakes. And he gave me the date, and I was like, oh, Tom, it's, a, you know, it's my teammate's wedding. And he goes, Taylor – just do the game, call him. So I called Doug Warren. I said, Doug, I'm going to miss your wedding. He goes, dude, no problem at all. I took a red eye after this game that you and I spoke at and immediately went back to Boston and I met him, you know, the morning for a bloody Mary and the celebration after. So at least I got to see Doug and his lovely bride. The point, <laughs> the point being Nate, I, I had no aspirations to do this. And when I say no, I mean, 0.0. .0. This is not something that I sought, sought after. This is not something I thought my entire time playing I was going to do. I thought I was going to be a general manager, team president. I had um, the thought process of all of that. That's what I thought I was going to do. And even during the 10 years since that you and I spoke, I've had a couple chances to do that with clubs. And I just – the one thing I've learned about commentating is that – it's, it, I go back to my what I answered you the first time. It's very similar to playing. If you are not prepared and you're not 100% engaged, you are going to be exposed. And then ultimately, you're going to do a disservice to the athlete. And this is what I mean by this. More often than not, when I was playing, my father would call me for, you know, he played 10, 12 years. And he knew who was watching games and who wasn't. After five minutes of commentating, and a lot of times the commentators, my dad was like, dude, dude who, who's calling those games? And I'm like, dad, I have no idea. He's like, because they're not watching games. They have no idea what you guys are normally doing. So when he said that, and then ultimately I end up doing this, Nate, the one thing I've learned is you owe it to the athlete to be 100% engaged. Now, listen, there are numerous amount of times the athlete's going to disagree with what you say. But no athlete is ever going to look at you if you respect the job, respect your game, and respect what you're supposed to do. Now, obviously, part of that is giving a strong opinion. But, Nate, I've never changed. I am the exact same guy I am on TV that I was in 2002 playing for the Revolution for the first time. I've never changed. So behind the scenes, nobody looks at it and is like, oh, he's given a hot take here. He's doing this. I, it's the same. This is who I am. I'm going to give you a strong opinion. If I have one, uh, I'm not going to make one out of the blue. And so I've just learned that you need to respect the game the same way you did as a player. If you're not prepared and you're not engaged, then you're doing a disservice, not only to the athletes, but to the fans and the fans are owed the, the, the soccer fan, Nate in 2020 compared to you and I talking in 2010 is exponentially more engaged but more educated so you better be on top of your job that's why you can hear it in my voice i've got such an energy for this job and i love what i do and i think in large part it's because the viewers grown and kept me accountable along with you know what i i owe it back to the game to respect it and to respect uh those players in that particular game i'm calling 
Well, I love the timeline of this conversation and the way the the math kind of works out there with the full decade uh, between that first time we met and talking right now. We actually did a feature length radio interview back in 2015. So that was right in between. And I'll never forget, actually, back in 2012, I was chatting with one of my greatest mentors and, and best friends in the industry and really someone who I owe oh so much to um and that is Derek Ray someone who has already been a, a guest on this show and I was just catching up with Derek after uh Euro 2012 had wrapped up and we were just having our kind of every few month uh, catch up email and phone call and I just was asking him how things went and one of the things that he spotlighted was this Taylor Twelman guy could be a really good co-commentator I know he's new at this thing but I'll never forget him saying that to me and that was back in 2012 so I, I have to ask you, I'm, I'm sure there will be some words on uh, the great uh, Aberdeen legend that is uh, Derek Ray. But in addition to Derek, uh, who have been some of the, the main influences for you in the, the craft of, of commentary? Folks who have, have really helped you be the best that you can be. First off, ESPN. And, and the reason why I'm saying that is that it comes down real simply to this. Nate, my first, I'm going to say 18 months. And so you got to take 2010 out of the equation because it really was only four games I did, maybe five. But then starting in 2011, I had 10 co-commentators, 10 play-by-play partners. And that, in a nutshell, helps groom anyone as fast as possible as any other tactic you can have. And with all due respect to Tony Romo, who's come into this job and completely lit it on fire. He's working with a hall of famer and Jim Nance and every single game is with Jim Nance. And now if everyone as a co-commentator and that as an ex player, more importantly, that's learning the craft has the opportunity to work with someone like that. Well, then it's going to help you ease into the job. ESPN went the other way. They just threw me into the fire. And Derek Ray was one of those. So so think of this. You have Derek Ray, John Champion, Ian Dark, Adrian Healy. That, in a, then you throw in Glenn Davis. So And then I did local games with J.P. Della Camera. So if you went through my 10 co-coms, my 10 play-by-play guys, from January 1st, 2011 to January 1st, 2013, Nate, that was the most influential thing in my life. Bar none, no questions asked. And I give all the credit in the world to ESPN because, in listen, part of it was by default. I wasn't the number one uh, color commentator. So you're just filling in. You're doing games. You're getting reps. You're doing whatever you can. But every Philadelphia Union game in 2011, I'm doing it with JP Della Camera. Then I'm filling in and doing games with anyone that I can. And then ultimately, 2012, it starts, you've got Ian Dark, and then I end up working with Derek Ray, and then I, you know, and Adrian Healy consistently. There's been so many of those little things you pick up. Now, listen, Nate, I'm not going to sit here and blow smoke and say that I wasn't fully aware of the opportunity. I was. And in large part, because I needed it. People don't understand where I was in my lifetime, post-concussion syndrome and, and dealing with the loss of your career. I needed to fully embrace this, and I did. And I had, you know, I, I spoke with Sean McDonough, great college football, NFL, basketball, uh, play-by-play guy. He's a huge friend of mine. I end up working with Mike Tirico, Bob Lee. I literally took my first four years and said, if I'm going to do this right, this is an internship, and I need to learn I need to figure it out. So I'd go watch a Monday night football game and just observe. I'd go watch college football, whatever I could do, go to the Celtics games. You know, Mike Gorman's an unbelievable guy here in Boston. He's a legend with Tommy Heinsohn. I literally called an entire quarter of Celtics basketball. <laughs> Nate, to, to Think of that to promote the Rebs. They had me on for one quarter and the entire time I'm, t- I'm looking, taking notes. I, that, I just absorbed every little bit of info because I had no aspirations of this. So, Nate, think of that. You you just it, your playing career is cut from you and then you've got to look at it. So when I did that Euros uh, 2012 with Derek Ray, I'm sitting there saying I'm doing two games with Derek Ray. I better be on my game. 
and I need to watch what he does. And so I, I really have just really been very appreciative of how ESPN handled my situation and made me work my rear end off because there are way too many guys that are trying to do this or coming in to do this that don't fully – they think I literally went from playing from the refs to calling games overnight. And that is – that takes away the 12 months of just every little, little gig, big gig that I took to do this. That's where I don't think people have a full appreciation of how you really turn into a co-com, if that makes any sense. It makes perfect sense. And and I have to ask you, when you bring up mental health and, and your recovery from the concussions that, that you went through and everything you were going through in your life, it really puts that conversation, that short conversation that we shared walking out of Buckshaw Stadium in 2010 in a different light and a different perspective for me. And I have to ask you, do you feel like it was almost a blessing, the fact that this was never something you ever considered, that it got to kind of come yeah. out of the blue the way that it did? Do you feel blessed by the way that kind of worked out? Absolutely, Nate. You you couldn't have said it best, my man. Um, yeah, you do. You just feel lucky. Uh, you feel like it was something that was out of your control and nothing you really planned and and just something that kind of fell in your lap, but not fell in my lap because that downplays how hard I work to try to figure it out and learn it. But to net, I mean, Nate, you said it. I, I feel so lucky that I found something I'm passionate about. Now, listen, <laughs> the listeners of this podcast and this interview, they, they've seen me enough. If I don't have any <laughs> energy, then you know something's wrong and I'm either sick or something's wrong. I've, I've got energy in everything I do, but there's a real passion to do this right. There's a real, I think real passion to still improve. That's the one thing that I think very few people understand as I still, every time I do a game with John champion, I'm like, you know what? I, I need to be better here. I need to be better there. Uh, that's also ESPN's nature. You know, ESPN is very critical behind closed doors, especially with me, which I thoroughly thrive in. And I love that. And I, and I enjoy that, but, um, that's a long answer. The answer is yes. I feel lucky uh, because I'm doing something I love and I'm talking about it with you, Nate. Like if you would have told me that 10 years ago, bro, I would have looked at you and said, yeah, right. No chance <laughs> in 2020, you and I are going to still be talking about me in a microphone in front of me talking about the game. Well, it's absolutely beautiful. And uh, here we are, and transitioning just a wee bit here, I'm glad you uh, brought up the energy and passion that you are so well known for. So, disclaimer, we're jumping into, I, I, I think you know where we're going here, uh, the quote-unquote what are we doing meme uh, from yeah. October of 2017. Um, it's still, for better or worse, um, it's still strong and relevant uh, two and a half, almost three years later, uh, from from that night on Sports Center and that infamous night in Cuba for the U.S. men's national team and that two one loss uh, to Trinidad and Tobago. I throw it right back to you, uh, Mr. Twelman. Do you feel that the U.S. men's national team is in any better or possibly worse position now uh, than we were on October tenth, twenty seventeen? Nate, the fact that you have to ask that question answers the question in itself. <laughs> I mean, the, the fact that we are talking in late March of 2020 and you have to ask that question, that answers it in itself, buddy. And, and so the more frustrating part of being an alum and also out of complete transparency for the for the listeners at home, I, I, I have partnered with U.S. Soccer to try to change concussion laws and heading and all that. So uh, listen, it, it's not as if I'm not, I'm on the outside and not inside that building, but with regards to the men's national team and the technical development of players and whatnot, Nate, it's disheartening. It's disheartening. The fact that, you know, the, how many lawsuits that the Federation has, it's disheartening to me uh, that the men's national team hasn't fully grasped um, how to develop players, and yet they're not really in charge of developing players. That's more based on the domestic league, and then you go through this vicious circle, and you sit there talking, and it all comes back to, why are we still talking about whether or not we've improved? Why hasn't there been substantial change? And here's the most important thing about what are, you, what are we doing 
and that meme and whatnot. First off, it wasn't orchestra. It wasn't. I didn't calculate that. That was that was as raw as it comes. I'm just very fortunate. I didn't drop an f bomb or cuss because <laughs> it would have changed the entire thing. But Nate, in all seriousness, I did an interview the following night with Scott Van Pelt, and he led his show with it's called. He does a segment called One Big Thing. And he brought me in there and he asked me that night, do you feel confident change will happen? And I answered it with this. My heart says yes. My brain says no. And I feel like my brain is going to be right. And I'm not sitting here to pat myself on the back. I just knew that the way soccer in this country has been operating for numerous amount of years, that was the breaking point in which you need to embrace real change and you've got to be more inclusive than exclusive for a sport since 1986 that has been more exclusive than any other sport in our country. And yet, no, you've got Sunil Galati and Bruce Arena and now Jurgen Klinsman, everyone pointing fingers at everyone else. You're a month, you're two months afterwards and you're still no answers and then you sit there and wait, and then there's a presidential election that made a complete mockery of the entire sport in our country. Nate, I'm sorry. Uh, you're asking me this in 2020, late March, and I still feel like we're, you, they're stuck in the mud. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that election that came, what was it, three or four months uh, after that fateful night in Cuba. There was a a, a fateful couple of months uh, surrounding that U.S. soccer uh, presidential election. And I have to ask you, Taylor, the Athletes Council and, and folks who are former U.S. players and, and standout great former U.S. players who are now in the, the broadcast uh, television landscape, I, I, I hold no qualms in saying this. I speak of, of Stu Holden and Carlos Boca. Negra, uh, specifically, both men who, who you've played with and, and have, have relationships with. The Athletes Council was a huge part of, of what got now former U.S. soccer president less than two years after being elected, Carlos Cordero, what got him elected in the first place. A huge, huge bit of it was that Athletes Council. And I have to ask you what your thoughts on when, when you hear... And look, not to pick on Stu or Carlos specifically, because there's plenty of other examples, but when you hear people give very boisterous, very strong, very passionate uh, uh, damnings of, and very reasonable, very, very righteous damnings of, of the things that are going on uh, with U.S. soccer, and when those same individuals were folks who were part of the Athletes Council that helped Carlos Cortero get elected, what goes through your mind when, when you hear those folks give those opinions that very much mirror yours and, and mirror mine, but I wasn't on the Athletes Council that helped Carlos Cordero win a relative sham of an election in 2018, Taylor. Yeah, Nate, I think that in a nutshell, uh, your question is the same question I have for U.S. soccer, and that goes back to my previous answer, change. Like, how, how's the board of directors not changed? How is there no turnover? How is there no term? How, how, the, how is the Athletes Council can, the same? See, this is where it gets very confusing to me, is that if Carlos Cadero failed the way he did, where's the accountability in our sport, in our country? You answer me that, Nate. There is none. There is no accountability. And so, you, you listen, everyone wants to point to Stu and Carlos. And listen, Stu and Carlos are bright men. And they understand the magnitude of what that role is. So you know damn well that they're at home under, I, I would hope so. And I'd be shocked if the answer was uh, the opposite. But I, there's no accountability. Liter literally, Nate, you asked me, the, answer me this. Where's the accountability in the sport in our, in our country? Overall, general, with the board of governors, with the board of directors, whatever the, the proper term is, with the athletes, it's non-existent. With the president, with any, anything, anything, where, where's the accountability? And so until there's accountability, that we fail to qualify for the goddamn World Cup in <laughs> Trinidad, and the president and the coach after the game are saying. Well, there doesn't need to really be substantial change. This is a one-off. 
Sunil Gawadi was not going to step down, Nate. Like, that answers your question. So, and listen, I, I do believe the Athletes Council, your question, it's 100% a fair question. That question needs to be asked to the board of directors, board of governors, whatever that proper, I, I get that wrong every time. But that's that that needs to be asked to them as well. Because Carlos was elected. Carlos was put in. But when I look at that election process and the way the president was elected in our country, you got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. And, th- and this is the other thing that's very interesting that nobody wants to say. But how many of those people that are part of the youth of U.S. soccer really care? As long as the pay to play thing continues and every single one of them is making six figures and whatnot, do they really care whether Carlos was successful or not? You know that answer, Nate. So 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 go through everything. If we're if we are really just gonna look, honestly, just look at Carlos and Stu, then we're not good doing a good enough job. It's it's everyone in there. It's anyone that had a say in that. But from my personal standpoint, Nate, to answer, I would not, I can't be on the Athletes Council and then be on your podcast. I can't. That's on a personal level because I can't technically, in my mind, be as critical or be as, um, what's the proper word? Be, you know, if I want to applaud them, I'm, you know, if I want to criticize or look at their positives, whatever you, I just can't do that. I need to be for ESPN. And listen, there's, Three or four of those presidential candidates all called me, and I literally didn't take the call. And I would text back saying, I can't do this. I can't I can't literally comment on anything because I am technically ESPN. Now, we're a huge partner in the sport, and we've got a huge say in it. But on, I couldn't put my head on the pillow and say, no, I'm going this way or I'm going that way. I talked to this person. I talked to this person. Do you know how many people, Nate? outside of the athletes council called the athletes council like what what is that so i until you until you or someone else because i've asked i don't get answers but until the accountability is real then nothing's really going to change it's really not well It's really interesting. Earlier in this chat here today, you talked about back in the day, your thoughts of one day being involved in general management and and potentially being a team president, that being kind of a very realistic dream of yours, something that could happen. Obviously, life has changed. You've you've developed this great reputation and a fulfilling career in life uh, as as a soccer broadcaster, as a, a co-commentator and, and all credit to the folks at ESPN who you've spotlighted. But was there ever a time when when it when it sank as low as it sank? And, and look, I'm not going to sit here and act like it's not still sinking uh, with things that are still happening. But was there ever a time where you maybe wondered if you wanted to get involved with the governance of the game, whether it was within U.S. soccer, whether that was in 2018 or or after or before. Was there ever a time where you maybe thought about it, Taylor? Uh, Maybe for a split second, maybe two seconds (laughs) total. Um, No, no, I um, no. uh, Do I want to help? Absolutely, Nate. Do I think I can help? Yeah, I do. Uh, but to know where to put that energy, how to do it, how to execute it, uh, no. I, I just, unfortunately, I don't know if if it is for me. Um, and, and in large part, because you start to weigh, you know, where can you make change? Where can you help change? Where can you help the ball and continuously roll you know, up the hill and do whatever, whatever analogy or buzzword you want to use. I just feel like, uh, my impact is greater right where I am right now, um, than anything else. And maybe I'm wrong on that. Maybe I am wrong, but from self-reflection and just having numerous amount of conversations regarding that. Yeah, no, I, I think I'm, I think I'm okay where I'm at. I am uh, quite grateful that, that you are where you're at, because as you said, you might not be uh, on my show if you were uh, in in a different position. So it is very, very good to have you. Um, that's enough of the uh, the U.S. soccer uh, conversation for now. Uh, um, 
we try to make this show quite evergreen. We, we, we try to keep this uh, right now as, as a bit of a positive distraction. And I hope folks are listening uh, to this episode months and months and months down the road. But I right now feel obligated uh, to diverge a little bit uh, away from that because of the news of Euro 2020 uh, being officially uh, moved. I know that was a huge, huge event on your docket. We were talking about your first experience at the European championships uh back in 2012 euro 2020 uh was was going to be big for not only for taylor twelman but for a lot of people for millions of people uh around the footballing world obviously with the the pandemic and everything going on with coronavirus and and covid19 euro 2020 for now is hopefully going to become euro 2021 so i have to ask you taylor what your new kind of outlook is going into the the spring and summer or well into the spring here as we're talking uh, in 2020 and into what was supposed to be a an international brilliant spectacle of of, of international footy uh during the summer what what is your mindset going into the summer and do you have any plans now or is it kind of just taking it all day by day like the rest of us it's day by day like the rest of like everyone and quite honestly we all should be day by day to day because literally every two to four hours nate there's new news there's you know Mm -hmm. you and i are talking right now and the city of toronto literally just broke news that they're banning all public events until june 30th so that has huge major league soccer implications let alone nba implications so this thing's very fluid unfortunately um but that's the nature of what we're doing and and Nate, I think we'll all look back on this uh, when there's a vaccine and everything and just say, wow, we were alive during that and we got through this. Like, it's just there, there's things happening in your life. September 11th comes to my mind right right off the top of my mind where I was. I was in Germany playing for 1860 Munich. Um, we're all going to remember this. And, you know, is it a little bit of a reset button? Yes. It, you know, we all I, I'm no different than anyone else. Uh, with the struggles are the implications of it all. Yes. Euros 2020 is now pushed to 2021, but it it wasn't canceled. Right. So I sit there and say, okay, you know, Nate, that's not Olympics was postponed, not canceled. Um, So you you just look at, I'm always a glass half full type of person when your outlook on it and try to get through things. And so um, 2021, is going to be a thrash. I'll tell you that right now, because when you look at, Euros 21 in there, and then also with World Cup qualifying involved. Now, luckily for the world of soccer football, World Cup 22 is in December. So you gain, in a weird way, that extra six months to fill in games. Does that make any sense? So, you know, Nations League, FA Cup games, you know, that kind of stuff, those may be postponed or outright canceled. But the leagues will get done, and and Euro 2020 albeit in 2021, it will happen and it's going to be an unbelievable spectacle. Don't you feel like, Nate, there's going to be a new lease on life when that vaccine mm-hmm. comes out and, mm-hmm. and and everyone gets out of this quarantine? I think there's going to be a new appreciation for the little things that many of us took for granted during all this. It's a major, major chance for, for all of us to to reset, heal, and and rebuild. You you summed it up perfectly there, Taylor. Now, wrapping up uh, uh, this conversation, this has been a great, great pleasure and privilege so having Nate, you on. Nate, this, Nate yes, hold yes, on, hold ahead. on real quick. You're going to die laughing. So this is what I mean by fluidity. Now, the mayor of Toronto releases a statement saying the ban till June 30th does not include sporting events. Hmm. <laughs> oh, okay. so, so, so it's, this is what I mean by it. literally, if you're literally on social media, everything changes like every 10, 12 minutes. Now, 98% of it's fake news, but you, that's up to you to figure out what, which is which. Anyway, sorry, I digress. No, no worries. All the more grateful uh, for, for the current uh, high from the social media landscape that uh, I am uh, taking uh, at this uh, moment, but uh, I, 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 I understand completely. I understand completely where you're coming from, and, and it really does sum it up, and, and we have to take it day by day and, and be the best empathetic uh, humans that that we can be, and we are going to look back on this when we get through this storm and, and have a new lease on life. As you said, I, I, I really do believe that, and I'm glad that, that you 
said that as as the guest on this show and and that's an outlook that that I want to share uh here as the host of this thing and this thing that I speak of uh is very much entirely a soccer show this is a show uh dedicated to the craft of of football co- Terry and football romanticism and the heart of the game and the gantries and the microphones and all that good stuff that that we love. However, I have to ask you, Taylor, I've always wanted to talk to you about this. I found this out during your playing career, and this was something that really uh, it, it had me it, it, it endeared you to me so, so much uh, based on my own personal sporting background. I grew up in a predominantly Mexican-American town. It's a major part of of my cultural heritage and and upbringing. And my two sports that I played the most and loved the most as far as watching and listening to and going to live events and becoming a a, a proper student of these two games was the one of the most unique sporting combos uh, that I, I, I seldom find anyone who shares this combo. I meet plenty of... Uh, football and basketball people, high school, college athletes who are three sport athletes. I've met people who are soccer players who are also played American football or played basketball in, in the other season. I have met, I could count on no more than a hand or two, the amount of soccer baseball people that I have mm-hmm. met in, in my life. It is a unique combo. It is part of what has endeared northern Mexico uh, to me in my time since moving uh, to San Diego and, and Tijuana, Monterrey, going down to Culiacan and Sinaloa and so many parts of the north of Mexico where soccer and baseball are uh, the two main sports. So I, I got to ask you, Taylor, um, how many soccer baseball people have you ever met and what does it feel like to be talking to one right now? Well, it's interesting, Nate, um, because soccer's the younger generation sport and baseball's the older generation sport. So you and I are a little odd in that sense, uh, because very few younger people embrace baseball the way our generations did growing up and especially our parents. Now, you got to keep in mind my family and my family's heritage. I, I didn't really have a choice. When your grandfather wins two World Series with the Yankees, You have an uncle drafted by the Astros. Your father plays college baseball and college soccer. I had to play some form of baseball. I had to. Just was no choice. If my brother, quite honestly, if my brother's sister and I were sitting at the Thanksgiving dinner table and said, no, we're going to be a teacher. We're going to do so. Everybody will looked at us and said, wait, what? Like, we didn't have a choice. Like, it's in your blood. Baseball is so hard for me, Nate, because I lived in died for it and breathed for it and did all of that. And my family's a baseball family. And yet that sport has frustrated me more over the last (laughs) five to seven years because of the lack of progressive thinking, the cheating, the at what the Astros did is pathetic. It's worse than steroids. And anyone that tells you it's not is completely ignorant to the sport of baseball, what it is. Um, baseball has been a tough one, pal. And it, listen, I'm a Cardinals fan through and through. I'll, I'll root for the Red Sox in, until they play each other in the World Series, and I'm always Cardinals. Um, and I'll go to a game here or there, and I'll watch the World Series. But other than that, buddy, I, I've been turned off by baseball and, and the lack of progressive thinking and the lack of real innovation in the sport. And I get tradition, dude. I get it more than – more than most people, but at some point you're going to be left behind. And right now, the way they've handled certain situations, Nate, I feel like they're going to be left behind. I couldn't agree more. However, to put the uh, slightest little positive bow uh, on this conversation and tying it even back to where we met and say, Santa Clara and back in 2010 in the broader Bay Area. 2010, such a great, memorable baseball year for me as it was when my beloved San Francisco Giants finally broke uh, their World Series curse and, and finally won the title in San Francisco for the first time. I love the fact, Taylor, that one of your greatest games in your career, a game I remember oh so yeah. well, came yeah. at at Pac, then Pac Bell Park, the home of my beloved San Francisco Giants. It's USA 3, Japan 2 back in 2005. Can we close with a a little trip back to that day of you scoring international goals on a baseball diamond? 
Yeah, that is, that was, it, first off, I remember the day before training in that stadium, and I literally looked at my Revolution and national team teammate, Pat Noonan, and I looked at Noonan and I said, how sick would it be to play shortstop in this building? Like the whole <laughs> stadium and the whole thing, the way it was set up, um, my word, man, that was, that was a fun time. That was a, uh, a real memorable three month stretch for me because it was really the first time I got to play, um, you know, with, with, with guys that started regularly with the national team, you know, my national team career, Nate was a indifferent one to say the least, uh, more often than not, when the full team was called in, I was called in and then I sat on the bench and then the games you played in, was, you know, the B team or the C team or whatever the analysts and, and people want to judge. But that was a time moment in time when, you know, Landon Donovan, Clint Dempsey, st- regular starters were called in and, and and I was playing. I played with Josh Wolf up front. and uh, Man, that was fun. But the best part was, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I had a baseball slide after my goal. Yep. I think it was a third yep. goal, right? And so – and everyone – you know, no one puts two and two together. And I remember that whoever was commentating on the game didn't notice that right away. Because right when, right after the game, my dad was like, oh, that was a great slide to second base. I was like, exactly. <laughs> it was more, but it was more of a home plate. Because second base, you slide with one leg out. I slid with two legs out as if I hit a, you know, a, a, an inside the park home run. But anyways, that was for baseball people, which literally went over about 99% of everyone's head that I just talked about. Well, except for the uh, young lad watching at home (laughs) on a Friday night as a young man in Watsonville, California going, I think he's a baseball soccer guy. That's so cool. I've never found all too many of those in my life. So that was what initially drew me to to you as a player. I love how fate worked out and us getting to meet back in 2010 and circling back here in in 2020. This is so cool. And and I love the way that, that things have aligned. Uh, for us, Taylor, and I look forward to doing this again with you sometime soon. And I've made kind of a tradition out of this. This actually started uh, with Peter Drury, who is uh, famous for not having any social media whatsoever. So uh, normally I would ask the guests to give out their social media handles and tell folks uh, how to get a hold of them. But for Peter Drury, I uh, offered him the chance to give a closing statement. Uh, in lieu of uh, social media handles. And so now now I feel like, uh, you know, with me off of the social channels for, for the foreseeable future, I want to throw it to Taylor Twelman to either or or both uh, give your social handles and uh, any closing words that you would like to share, sir. Yeah, I, I, I am amazed that Peter is still not on Twitter. That's a, that's remarkable. We've got a guy here at ESPN Zubin Mahenti that's still not on Twitter or Instagram. He doesn't even have Netflix. And that's when you're like, what are you like, dude, what do you do? Um, Not anyone can find me at Taylor Twelman on Instagram at Taylor Twelman on Twitter. Um, And I enjoy it, Nate. I appreciate the time uh, for me to tell my story and hopefully the listeners hung in there and, and I'll, I know I'm going to be talking to you down the future. So speak to you then. And that's going to do it for episode seven of the heart of the game. Another huge thank you to our friend Taylor Twelman for joining us. My name is Nate Abaurea for everybody at worldsoccertalk.com and the gaffer Chris Harris. It's bye for now. We'll talk to you next time on the heart of the game.